Good evening. My name is Dr. Tane Akalatsi, and I am the co-champion of Enlightening Talks at CSU Global. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Colorado State University Global Campus Enlightening Talks series. Tonight's program is titled Crisis Management from All Angles. And as we get started, I want to remind everyone that CSU Global is committed to the foundational principles of academic freedom. And as such, any speaker presenting material through enlightening talks also has freedom to express his or her own views, which do not necessarily reflect the views of CSU Global. In a moment, we will hear from Dr. Beverly Muhammad, Program Chair for Business Management at CSU Global. Thank you, Tanae, and welcome everyone to tonight's session of Enlightening Talks. I'd like to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Enid A. Thompson. Dr. Enid A. Thompson has years of experience in communication, HR operational and management systems, and strategic planning to overcome key uh, organizational hurdles for sustainability and renewal. Dr. Enid creates breathtaking results through education, training, and 360 degree analysis and assessment of various company situations. Dr. Enid understands that communication has an emotional impact on how individuals and teams coordinate, share knowledge, and accomplish tasks. Dr. Thompson currently teaches at Hamilton High School in the CTE department and oversees the DECA program. Dr. T, as she is affectionately called, is an innovator and her students love her. The marketing and business student population at Hamilton has increased 66% since Dr. T joined the team. Dr. T values relationships, good communication, and a born collaborator, and is able to gain the consensus with her practical application of compassion and skill. Dr. T is an accomplished author, as you can see several of her published books that cover topics from self-help to sustainable business. Without further delay, I present to some and, and introduce to others, Dr. Enid A. Thompson. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad and Colorado State University for having me here. I am honored and humbled. Um, before we get started, what do you think my initials spell? That's right, eat. Enid Elaine Thompson. Well, what do you think that my name spells backwards? Dine. That's a little trivia for us, and I do love food. One of my favorite quotes is failing to plan is planning to fail. And then I am always focused on preparation and being prepared. So I love this quote by Stephen Covey. It says, begin with the end in mind. Today, I want to share information about crisis management and how it should be incorporated into our everyday lives. But before I get started, I'd like to give you some background to my research. I began thinking about a business problem for my dissertation, something that needed to be solved. And with my operational and HR background, I encountered several times uh, employee motivation, employee retention, and also employee engagement. How can we engage our employees to where they are performing at their optimal level, that they're happy to be coming to work and fulfilled uh, while they are there. Well, communication is the heartbeat of any relationship, and it is a vital stage in any process of the relationship building. 
I finally discovered Timothy Combs' situational crisis communication theory, which was called SCCT. I selected SCCT as a framework for my conceptual, as my conceptual framework for my study. Combs and Holliday noted that researchers uh, could use this theory, situational crisis communication theory, to determine how people would react to a crisis, how communication affected them emotionally. They also needed to um, assist business owners, especially small business owners was their focus in regards to how their employees would perceive a crisis while they were actually handling the issue and how they were perceived by their employees to be affected in regards to bringing order into chaos or trying to resume their business operations, which would minimize the effects of the adverse effects on their profitability, their performance history. There are three constructs to SCCT. The first construct is understanding the severity of the crisis. The second is the amount of personal control the organizational leader has over the crisis and the company's performance history. Communication is very powerful and it has an emotional impact on how individuals and teams share knowledge and how they coordinate. If there is a disruption in communication, it definitely can appear, interfere with loss of revenue, employee retention, and the recovery process. The potential themes pertaining to the SEC phenomena, uh, one that comes to mind is the SNG research from 2014. It describes a natural disaster as an event caused by nature or by humans. A disaster can either be sudden or progressive in nature. I would like to interject two operational definitions. So those, for those of you that are taking notes, you might want to write these down. I will reference them later on in the presentation just to show you how they connect. These two uh, definitions, the first one is crisis. And I'm going to use Dayton's uh, definition from his research back in 2014. His study noted that crisis is an unexpected event that creates levels of uncertainty and threatens daily routines and goals. The second operational uh, definition is natural disaster. I'm going to use Morrison's definition from his research in 2014. Um, a natural disaster is a calamitous event resulting in a geological imbalance and an at atmospheric imbalance as well. It includes chaos, disruptions of operations, and daily routines. The results of a natural disaster also could include confusion and death. Crisis management from all angles touches every area of our lives, not just business. And as you can see from the topics that are sitting here in the PowerPoint presentation, it touches everything, community, family, education, natural disaster planning, relationships, resilience, uh, large corporations, small corporations, there is literally no limit to uh, crisis management, crisis communication, and how we should pay attention and incorporate that into our everyday lives as well. The research question for my study, I had to think of a business problem, as I stated earlier, and being in HR, background and operational uh, management, and communication being a focal point of my responsibilities, I needed to find out strategies, especially for small business owners, that they could use to resume their business operations quickly, minimize the adverse effects of a natural disaster on their company's profitability. So the natural uh, outcome was what communication strategies do small business owners use to facilitate resuming their business operations and minimizing adverse effects on a natural from a natural disaster on their company's profitability. This research was expanded. The purpose of my original uh, quantitative 
excuse me, qualitative descriptive multi-unit case study was again to develop strategies or bring strategies for resolution for small business owners to be able to recoup their businesses quickly after a natural disaster while minimizing the adverse effects on their profitability. After the publication of my dissertation, I expanded my research to include life experiences, death of a spouse, child, parent, a divorce, illness, and even loss of employment, just to name a few. All of these events are crises and also can be natural disasters for individuals and families. And because these events are unexpected, they create levels of uncertainty. And in addition to life-changing events, they disrupt our daily routines. Most times they are sudden, calamitous, and the events include chaos. The data collection and analysis that I used were semi-structured interview questions, note-taking, company documents, and then I used the Invo software 11 plus for the data analysis. I gained a wealth of information and insight from the semi-structured interview questions. My research centered on the town of Belmar, New Jersey. Two small business owners, one with multiple locations, quickly reopened their business operations after Hurricane Sandy devastated their town in 2012. The resilience, care, and commitment shown by these two individuals and, com and the community of Belmar were astonishing. But let's look at what's happening today with this recent event, Hurricane Michael. Ask yourself, what could they have done to increase rapid recovery and use preventive measures? That's something that we need to always think about. The four emerging themes from the data collection were communication, community, disaster recovery, and stakeholders, the employees. The four emerging themes were fascinating how they all came together. The first thing, communication. During my interview with the participants, I will call participant one, he stated that as a leader, he would often forget to have conversations or just spend time with his employees. This participant described communication as a way to establish an understanding of people. And he was right, because this also aligned with the research of Missy and Resin in 2015. Communication is the overriding action that can produce a successful outcome while building relationships of trust. This is vital, especially in the present day of texting and emailing. We just will not pick up the phone or have a face-to-face -face conversation with in individuals. We are just sitting there texting and, or emailing, and a lot of times information and emotion gets lost in the translation of doing that. The participant, uh, one, informed me that before Hurricane Sandy hit, the town officials and several members of the community got together and discussed their crisis plans, which was excellent because the research from Jenkins in 2016 states to understand the aftermath of a major crisis or natural disaster, uh, planning needs to be done ahead of time. And they need to exercise drills and tests to make sure that when something happens, it would be more so of a reaction, a natural reaction than a panic or a chaos uh, that results from the uh, natural disaster or, or crises. Both participants one and two used metaphors when I was uh, interviewing them. And I started wondering like, why are they using so many metaphors? Like this storm was a monster and wow, I couldn't believe the outcome. It just felt like the world was coming to an end. And as I was taking notes, I started to think, what other research can I go back on and see and do some comparison to see if that is kind of a natural occurrence? And there was. Abramson's research in 2015 talked about 
how the overwhelming effect of a natural disaster and a or a crisis affects our communication, our thought pattern. Sometimes we just can't find the words to express the deep emotion that we are experiencing because these are unexpected uh, events and these are occurrences that are not normal. They are totally out of the ordinary. They are unusual. And so we struggle to find uh, a way of coping or a way of communicating the deep uh, concern or fears or uh, even resentment or anger that we may be experiencing at that time. Abramson also went into research about the resilience activation framework. It's called RAF, and I found it quite fascinating. The RAF, the resilience activation framework, simply includes the ability to adapt. We must be able to adapt or withstand or adjust, we need to be agile uh, and flexible when natural disasters or crises occur. We need to be able to calmly collect ourselves and recover quickly. That requires sometimes you just have to step back from what's going on, take a breath, uh, and then begin again. It is a challenge uh, for me uh, today to fit in three years of research and study in a 30 minute uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I will do my best to do that. What I would suggest is when you have a moment, you can go to amazon.com and uh, check out my book, Managing Effective Communication After a Crisis, to get the full impact and all of the information that would actually help you to prepare for a crisis or a natural disaster, regardless if you are a small business owner, if you are a family member, uh, just whatever walk of life you may have, it would definitely be a benefit to you. Let's see how my findings confirm or disconfirm or extend the knowledge. My study confirmed previous work of the uh, original authors of the SCCT, which was Combs and Holiday, back in 1996. Dunn and Abel's research in 2015, Morrison's work in 2016, and Kahn's work in 2013, and a host of others conclude that critical communication analysis techniques are part, are part of the crisis management and crisis communication framework, which ensures that the message of the leader or the person in the position of power does not marginalize or silence the alternative communications. And a lot of times we do hear in the news and maybe might have experienced yourself a natural disaster or a major crisis and the marginal or the less fortunate voice were not heard and their needs were not met. And that's really important. It's critical um, because we are all connected. We are all community. And it is important that every voice is heard. Khan's work in 2013 indicated that effective communication after a crisis depended upon two areas, and these areas are quite vital. The first area was technology, and the second is relationships. Technology and relationships are vital for the coordination and execution process for recovery. In Swanger's research in 2016, she wrote, being prepared in the event of a catastrophe was not an option. It was necessary. How the study findings relate to the conceptual framework. My findings also confirm that Combs conceptual framework is the underpinning of the four elements that emerged uh, from the data which was collected and analyzed for my study. Situational crisis communication theory is an evidence-based management that is joined by business and social concerns. Combs' research has evolved from how communication affects people's perception and reactions to a crisis to a vital strategy for mitigating loss and supporting rapid recovery for businesses. This can also extend to personal lives as well. And I would definitely extend it to that because emotions, the emotional fallout from a personal crisis such as death, loss of employment, or medical illness can result in deficiencies in communication. 
and cause a loss of revenue and interfere with the recovery process. The implications for social change. We need to think differently. We need to change our paradigm. The implications for social change are huge here. Hans' work in 2015 indicates that the need for a simultaneous integration of economic, environmental, and social dimensions without one being emphasized over the other is necessary. Actually, it's vital in crisis planning and the recovery phase. I also concur because a natural or human induced disaster affects our economic, our environmental and the social dimensions of our lives. Here are a few examples of all three categories being touched that require immediate attention. What comes to mind would be the student loan uh, default crisis, the cost of higher education and the quality of health care, the cost and new requirements for home purchases, renewable energy and clean air, and the cost of much needed repairs of our infrastructure throughout the United States and the world and other countries as well. Certainly change, new thinking and innovation and definitely creativity must be fostered. I will share my thoughts on each of these categories in detail at another time. That'll be a topic for my next book. In the meantime, I hope the information that I provided you today was enlightening and innovative enough for you to want to pursue this area of research for the future. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and I would love to thank again Dr. Beverly Muhammad and Colorado State University's Global Campus for having me. And for more information, as I said earlier, you can go to amazon.com and you could pull up my name and you will see the books that I've written uh, regarding this topic. And again, now I'd like to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. T. We have time for a few audience questions, which I will read and then Dr. T will respond. Do we have any questions? We have one here. It says, can natural disasters slash crisis be proactively prevented in any form rather than reactively for the ones that are not knowingly coming, such as a hurricane, like Hurricane Michael recently? And if not, will having plans for potential adaptive recovery get a business and or person through a natural disaster crisis in a better fashion? Also, great speech. Oh, thank you very much. And boy, that's a good question. It's a long question. Let's take like it. Down. If you'd like for me to break it up again, I can. No, no, I've got it. I was kind okay. of jotting down some notes. Uh, to answer your question, yes, there are measures that we can take in order to be prepared for a crisis such as a hurricane. Um, there are natural disasters and also human induced crises like the bombing in Boston um, or some of these incidents that happen uh, at the airports that we don't even expect, but we can prepare. The first thing is always for a human induced crisis such as something that happened like at the, uh, the Boston Marathon that was totally unexpected. People were there, they were enjoying the event, the event had started and then chaos broke out. But first of all, we must be aware of our surroundings. We must pay attention to detail. Anything that looks out of order or brings suspicion must be investigated or must be reported. We, we should err on the side of caution instead of saying, oh, it's no big deal, and then we move forward. So first, pay attention to your surroundings, especially in large crowds. If it is a natural disaster, such as a hurricane, well, there are times we normally get a heads up that the weather is changing and that there is weather approaching. In that even before we reach hurricane season, because I am from Florida, uh, when my husband and I first moved there, 
there was a list that we made and it was for hurricane supplies, a generator, uh, the, the dry good foods, clean water, uh, the air, things to clean our bodies as well. I mean, practical things that you, there is a checklist and there are also websites, government websites that you can go to, obtain the list for your city, from your local government as well. And then you just go down the list, check out the list, get those supplies. You have a emergency plan for your family, who to call, where to go. There are things that we definitely can do. The main thing that I would say is to stay open, stay flexible, because again, these events bring uncertainty. And even though some of the best made plans may not be able to work through, we have to use our common sense. We must stay calm. We must stay open and agile to be able to move quickly and shift our plans as well. Is there another part of the question that I forgot? Or did I answer your question? I think you, I think you answered this question well, Dr. T. Thank you. Um, this person has not responded back, but we do have another question. What is the A in RAF? RAF, as I talked about before, is the Resilience Activation Framework. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Let's see. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. So I have a question, a couple of questions, Dr. T. Okay. What prompted you to research crisis management? Wow, well, um, my background, as you know, is in human resources management and operational management. I am very concerned about being prepared uh, in my personal life as well as my professional life. Uh, one of the criteria concerning my dissertation, as I stated earlier, was to find a business problem that we could solve. And so it was just a natural fit. Uh, I knew communication was very, very important because it's very important to me. It affects every, every area of our lives, uh, especially during, during the building of a relationship and also maintaining a good solid relationship, you must communicate. And so once I found uh, Combs and Holiday's research on uh, crisis communication theory, it, it was just was a natural fit. It was just a natural fit, so. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Now, you know, um, Colorado State University Global Campus is fully online. And after I read um, your topic for discussion, I began to think, you know, what do you see as online crisis vulnerability. We're an online institution. How do you see us being vulnerable to crises? Well, um, good question, Dr. Muhammad. Well, um, there is something on, out there on the internet. It's called the Internet of Things, the IOL, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, it has expanded uh, over a few vendors and customers. And what is happening is that people are now pausing to pay attention to the security risks associated with these online devices, the internet. Uh, the influx of additional entry points to an organization and into our personal devices, you know, our phones or computers, uh, is huge. What we have done as a society is that we have begun to give up our privacy and our security for convenience. And I think uh, there are, this is the time where we need to kind of maybe step back a moment to rethink that. There are so many holes that are out there for a home and for a business uh, regarding uh, things that are uh, internet connected uh, without saying, and these, these malwares, these antiviruses sometimes just aren't sufficient. And there was a survey by Price the, um, I'm thinking, give me a moment, the uh, money, money supermarket. 
in the UK. That is the name. And they're considered, they are consumers. And they were considering the perils of these online devices. They ran a study and they were talking about, I mean, these figures were high. I think they were around 50, 55, maybe even 60% that these devices don't carry a third party security uh, uh, clearance or level or whatever. And the risk for vulnerability and intrusion was huge. And so they were starting to alert people, you know, and then just the response that they received, they were pretty astonished and they were worried because people just were not concerned. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Another question that I have is, um, in what ways might the government increase their support to society and, and, um, and companies in times of crises? You know what, actually, that question is really simple. Um, when I was doing my study uh, with those two small business owners and some other people in Delmar, New Jersey, the, the constant theme that kept coming up was government just exasperated their recovery efforts. These individuals came together as a community and moved quickly to reopen 90% of their businesses within a two week period without any government assistance. Um, and it was actually months and also I think maybe a year, year and a half later when the resources started coming. So I, you know, it, it just astonished me. What I think the, these government officials need to do is get back to the basics and that is knowing their constituents and having hearts of compassion and being able to hear the voice of the people, which is totally lost right now when we've got so many people bickering and fighting over, over uh, several topics. They, they just have to get back to the basics and that is having hearts of compassion, empathy, and being able to hear the voice of their constituents or for the people which they were elected to serve. And, and let me just add this, because this, this is what I tell my students all the time. Leadership is about service and it's service with responsibility. And there's a grave responsibility, great responsibility that comes with leadership. And I think uh, there are some, not all, but there are some of our leaders today that have just totally forsaken that. Thank you. I couldn't have said that better. I have um, one final question. Uh, we talked about the government and what they can do to support society and companies. But I wanted to ask you today with all the natural catastrophes, some predictable, others not, what do you believe communities and companies can do better in terms of preventative things uh, for catastrophes? Okay, um, good question. Um, again, like I said, we need to get prepared. They can perform drills and tests. They can do pilot exercises. Uh, we have those all the time here at the school. We have fire drills, we have lockdown drills, um, we have tests. But one of the main things that I think is really important is they need to get back to starting now, build relationships, get back to this face-to-face -face interaction and connecting with people on an emotional level. Communication is very emotional. And when these situations occur, if you don't have a solid foundation with a coworker or a family member, it is just going to be exasperated. It's going to bring more stress. It's going to be levels of uncertainty, disruption in communication, and it is going to wreak havoc. So I would say get prepared now, get back to the basics of being kind to one another, having conversations with one another, pick up the phone and say, hey, this is Dr. T, I didn't want anything, I was just checking on you. That's how you build connection. That's how you build unity. Um, also collaborate. Talk with your coworkers, talk with your family members about your escape plan. What should happen when a disaster or a natural, uh, excuse me, a natural disaster or crisis occurs. It's called, literally, it's almost like, um, how do I say this? Um, you just need to have your emergency plans together and talk about them a lot. And, you know, and I want to say once a month or once a week, I'm just saying you need to talk about them as much as possible. You need to perform the drills. You need to perform the tests. And sometimes, you know, people in leadership, they need to just actually do it without letting maybe their employees know. Or if you're a parent, maybe 
try something with your child, you know, have a drill or something that the child is not expecting to see how they react, to make sure that they will be okay in the time of a real crisis or a natural disaster. Great, great response. You know, uh, Dr. T, as you were speaking, I thought about, and some of you on the call are probably not as old as I am, but uh, I recall when my parents were alive, we actually would have what they call air raid drills. And in the air raid drill, we had to go and take shelter in our basements. And my mother, we thought it was ridiculous as kids, but she would fill containers with water and she had canned goods that she stored in the cellar and she, she actually jarred food and we had blankets, we had flashlights and transistor, some of you don't know what that is, transistor <laughs> radios, but it was all in the spirit of being prepared for um, a nuclear catastrophe. So um, what Dr. T is saying here, it just has so much merit and it's very important. And that's a good segue, Dr. T, to the next question. There's a question where the person asks, do organizations need to have a task force to handle crisis management or should it be a group mission? You know, it depends on your organization and the heartbeat of your leader. Uh, for example, the small business owners in Belmar, uh, participant one had several employees. And what they did is they did have a task, a task force. There was a person responsible that had the person's uh, email address, phone numbers, you know, the contact information of all the employees. And what astonished me is how quickly they moved right after Sandy had hit. That person was literally on the phone. Some of their phone lines were down. They had used their cell phones. Uh, they were having issues with communication. Some of them actually had to actually go walk or run because they couldn't drive. The, the town was just full of water or a boat and go actually to go check on other people. And what I found astonishing is how their business opened so quickly. The employees, majority of them, for participant one left their homes to go to the place of business to get it back up and running because it was a restaurant and they needed uh, that much needed resource for food and also for shelter for those that didn't have it. So yes, a task force is definitely necessary. And if the organization is larger, then they need to have multiple individuals uh, taking up that, that task. But each employee is responsible for knowing what needs to happen, how it needs to happen, and then also hopefully maintaining a era of calm during the, the fallout. Great. Another question is posted here. What are the costs related to planning for crisis management? Was that covered in your research at all? It was in detail, yes. Um, and it depends again on the size of the organization or if we're doing it on a personal level with a family. For me, example, and my husband, when we got our list, the information that we got uh, was free. It was a free resource and it was on a government website in our city. I was local. and But the cost of getting these items, it, it could be expensive. We had to buy a generator, we had to buy food, we had to buy goggles, we had to buy water pills, you know, in case the water was bad. Um, there, there, were, there were so many things, shoes, there was gloves, goggles. You would be amazed at some of the things that we had to buy. Now, some people don't go to that extreme. Well, you know me, I am a, I love preparation. So I went to the max in regards to what was required. So the cost can vary depending on if it's a family, depending on if it's a small business or if it's a large corporation. The cost can be as minimal, uh, as, minimal uh, as possible if you are a family or a small business owner, I would suggest. But if you're a large corporation, you have much more exposure um, 
in regards to loss. So you might have to kind of put out a few more dollars than the average person. Great. Another question here is what areas in your opinion have become major sources of crisis due to advances in technology? Ooh, okay. Well, tell me the question again one more time. What areas do, in your opinion, have become major sources of crisis due to advances in technology? Well, the first thing that comes to mind would be our airlines. Uh, you know, not, even since 9-11, just so many scares and threats that we've had uh, at our airports all around the world, our train stations, our bus stations, uh, transportation. Um, is a major, major concern regarding um, human-induced and also natural disasters because even with Hurricane Sandy, the subways and uh, airports and things were shut down because they were flooded. So uh, that would be the first thing that came to mind. You know, Dr. T, as I read that question, I thought about the class that I'm teaching and um, my students are constantly talking about the driverless automobiles. In fact, uh, here in the Arizona area, we had a driverless Uber car driving. And it, of course, there was a person that was there monitoring the car, but she looked up too late and it struck an individual and he killed that individual. And this is a case where advances in technology can be, can create crises. And we have to give a lot of thought to this new and innovative ways of doing things. And then the class also interjected, who's responsible for that accident? Is it the insurance company? Is it the automated uh, company that created the automation? You know, who's responsible? So you raise a very good point. You know, it, it's amazing. And maybe I'm dating myself uh, at this point, but I do remember uh, vaguely the air drills. But what I remember more prevalent, I remember in 1972, there was a large earthquake in Los Angeles and we were living in Los Angeles at the time. And my dad had already gone to work. He worked for Western Airlines. And so that really kind of dates myself because Western Airlines got bought out by Delta years ago. Um, and I remember waking up and the bed was just shaking, going to the middle of the room. And we, you know, we're kids. We're crazy. We're like, yay, you know, we're playing. And I, you know, we're laughing and crazy. And here comes mom, you know, running up and she says, come on, everybody. You can remember what, what dad said? Dad's not here. So we got out of the uh, the bed, and we got in the doorways back in those days. And and if you were at school, you got under the desk. Uh, but even then, you know, it was important to have a plan and to be able to execute it. Uh, and then now with this technology, there's so much going on. Uh, that and, and don't get me wrong, because I I'm I'm all for technology, but I believe that there needs to be a balance there. For one, our individual rights of privacy should not be uh, so loosely given up for technology. There needs to be a sense of responsibility and accountability for that as well, because you do raise a good question, who is responsible? And we do know in the court system, it would be, okay, no, it's the insurance company. Okay, no, no, it's the, uh, the company that invented the technology. Oh, no, 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 it was the person that was in the car because that was, that's another uh, safety you know, measure that we, you know, implement to prevent things like that. So it would be bouncing around in our judicial system for years uh, to avoid responsibility of a life being lost because of technology. Um, it, it's just amazing to me. We, need, we do need to get back to the basics even as we continue to step forward in the future with technology. Excellent. I have um, uh, one final question here, at least I don't see any others, and it says, do we need to keep certain areas low tech to prevent or to limit incidents of things such as identity theft, financial fraud through the internet? These incidents are major business and personal crises. 
that's an excellent question. I actually had some brief conversations with my students today. We are actually talking about business finance and the foundation of a, a prototype business. We're talking about types of credit and things like that. And so I went into detail to tell them, remember in our, in our day and age, that when we had paper, everything was, was paper. And so we had some type of recourse in regards to if there was a dispute or if there was an error. It was like, I'm sorry, on this document that I signed with Dr. Muhammad back in 2014, Four, it says such and such and such and such. And here is the document to prove that. Well, now we're in this digital age where they can change a document. The document can disappear because we don't print out. We want to save our trees, which is good. Uh, but things can also be changed. Our phones, we take pictures with our phones. We don't take pictures hardly anymore with a 35 millimeter or a uh, I forget the, that Polaroid camera where you snap it and it spits out <laughs> and you have it in your hand and you can put it in a photo album. They can digitally change you and me. They could put my head on your body and your head on my body and I could be you and you could be me. There's so much going on, uh, even with our social security numbers. It is pretty much everything once the last four of your social, um, you know, to log into something. It is just amazing how we, again, give up so much of our personal information, which is important for convenience, but it still puts us at risk, again, for identity threat theft and for all other types of fraud as well. It's interesting you should mention Social Security because just recently, the and, and Medicare, in fact, um, has just recently, they were issuing Medicare cards with individual social security numbers on them. And just recently, they announced that they're going to remove those numbers from the cards and issue unique ID, alphanumeric ID numbers, which um, you would have thought in this day and age that no company is using social security numbers as identification. So um, this, this individual, Paul, who raised this question, raised a very good question. It is business and personal, and it's a serious thing that we're dealing with. It is. It really is. And so I've been telling my students, because uh, they're young, uh, to guard their personal information, you know, not to be so casual in regards to giving out your social security number or even having that information on your phone uh, because they use their cell phones for everything and they're always with, you know, always with them. And so um, it's something because once they get a hold of your credit, I man, they can just wreak havoc for years and, and possibly you not recover from that. Absolutely. Well, I don't see any other questions. So um, I, that concludes our question and comment section. Thank you, Dr. T. Thank you for having me. This, this is great. Thank you, Dr. T. We really appreciate having you here this evening. So thanks for sharing your time and insight on crisis management. And that concludes our enlightening talks for tonight. A huge thanks to our speaker for her time and participation. And thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. And we really hope that you found the conversation on crisis management informative and useful. To register for upcoming Enlightening Talks sessions, you can do so from the Enlightening Talks webpage at CSU Global dot edu slash enlightening dash talks on behalf of everyone at colorado state university global campus we want to thank you and have a wonderful evening